So we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The children may be dismissed for children's worship. Well, I've been here a long time. And so, you know, I've seen a lot of changes uh, take place here at the church, as many of you have as well. Changes uh, not only in people who attend, but changes uh, in staff, changes in our building, changes in equipment. You know, I, you had already moved into this sanctuary before I came here. I think I came here the first summer that you were in here. But, but the, the narthex, the, old, the far section of the narthex where the cafe is now, uh, I've seen that go through so many different changes. I mean, I remember when uh, the church nursery was where our, our, church, our current church office is uh, right now. And that the ladies' room um, is where part of the church office used to be. The downstairs bathrooms are kind of where the man cave is. And, uh, and at least the men's room, the men's room back then was, was as nasty looking as that man cave is right now. And so, uh, so I, I've seen a lot of different, a lot of different changes. And, and the equipment uh, certainly has changed uh, around here. You know, uh, when I came here, the, the church had no copy machine. They just used a mimeograph machine. And you probably would have to Google that to see what that looks like and see what that actually is. And, and the church uh, office manager was, back then was called a secretary, but still, as is now, they're the, they're the boss of the place around here, you know. But, um, but she had no computer, you know. She had a typewriter, and the senior pastor had a typewriter, and I just hand wrote everything, which drove the church secretary crazy when I had to give her stuff to, to type for me. But, and I remember when we got our first, uh, when the church got its first computer. We, it was in the main office, and, and we all shared that one computer. And then uh, the phone system that we had here, it was a rotary, rotary phone. And so we have a picture of it, because I'm sure the young people don't even know what this thing is, you know? And while they make fun of us for not being tech savvy, I doubt that any of them know how to use that thing, you know? But I remember it being so frustrated um, because I would call places because because I think that we had to be the last place on the planet to have rotary phones. And so when I call a place and they say push one for this, two for that, three for that, and I, I, have, I have no buttons to push. I just have to sit there. I'm thinking, what, what's wrong with this church? Why can't they, they move on and make the change? But we have made a lot of changes, and there's been a lot of changes in our world. We've seen that a lot this year, a lot of changes in our church this year. For those who went through confirmation uh, years ago or even in the recent years, now confirmation is 30 minutes uh, before church on Zoom, you know. Things are different, and our world is constantly changing. And what I want you to, to see, what I want us to understand this morning is that God wants to use you to change your world and that you can change your world. And to help us to understand that, I want us to look at a familiar story in the Bible, a familiar miracle. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And except for Jesus' resurrection, uh, this is the only miracle that appears uh, in, the gospel, in all four gospel accounts. And we're going to look at the gospel account of, from Mark, uh, Mark chapter 6. And so you can turn there if you would like to, and I'm just going to read that passage, even though it's somewhat familiar to, to many just want to read it uh, for you at this time. This is Mark chapter 6, beginning at verse 30. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began, to, so he began teaching them many things. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much money on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? He asked, go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. 
Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. So here's, here's the story. You know, Jesus has, uh, has the disciples, the 12 disciples had just returned uh, from a ministry tour that Jesus sent them on. And they were excited telling Jesus about all the stuff that they were, that they were doing. And so Jesus wanted to take them to a, a private place, you know, where they can be alone and, and get some rest. And so they hop into a boat and, and they head out. And apparently they weren't too far from shore because people could see them and recognize that it was them. And they were watching where they were going. So the people, there are a group of people were following them on land. And that group just continued to grow as they went from town to town. And, and so when Jesus got to where he was headed with his disciples, there was already a crowd there uh, to meet them. And Mark writes this. He says, Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. And if you're going to change your world, you must see the needs that are there. Jesus saw the need. Mark says that Mark tells us that Jesus saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them. But Jesus is not the only one in the story that saw a need. The disciples also saw a need. Jesus, you know, he's teaching uh, the people, and Mark writes, by this time, it's getting late in the day. So again, here's Jesus teaching, and, and he was healing, and, and, and he's going on and on. And the disciples are probably, you know, they're probably checking their watches, thinking, I'm getting hungry, and I think the people are probably getting hungry. You know, is it, when is it going to stop? You know, think of it this way. Here you are, you know, we're gathered here at a church, and you're listening to me, you know, and, um, and all of a sudden you look at the clock, and it's 1130, I'm still going strong. But, but you're kind of okay with that because you're pretty fascinated by what I'm saying. But then all of a sudden it's like 12 or 1 and 2 o'clock, and you're thinking, holy smokes, and you're looking for, a, you're looking for an elder to kind of get up here to stop me. Because you're concerned about others, you know, that they're hungry probably and they want to they go home, you know. And, so, um, and so, so here the disciples realize, you know, it's getting late, late in the day. And, and so they go to Jesus and say, you know, you probably should send these people away so they could find themselves some food and maybe at this point some lodging. See, the disciples recognized the need. They recognize that these people are going to need to eat something. And so let's send them away to find some food. And in John's gospel account, we realize that a young boy recognized and saw a need as well. And, and, and he offered his lunch, his supper, his five loaves and two fish. Uh, he offered it to Andrew, and Andrew brought that to Jesus. And if we are going to change our world, we must first see the needs that are there. And there are many needs. I mean, there's needs in our world at large. There are needs in our state. There are needs in our town. There's needs in our, in our church. There are needs in our school. There are needs in our families, in our in our circle of friends. As a matter of fact, there are so many needs that it can almost seem overwhelming. So my challenge is just, just pick one. Because if we're going to change our world, not only do you need to see the need, you must take action. Here again, Mark writes, Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Jesus saw the need, and his compassion for them caused him to take action. Almost every time the Bible tells us that Jesus felt compassion, it resulted in Jesus taking action. Jesus' compassion moved him to, to the action of teaching and, and of healing and eventually uh, of feeding uh, this group of people. And our compassion needs to be more than just this feeling that we have inside. It must move us to action. And in order to have compassion, we must, see, we must be able to see beyond ourselves and to the needs of those around us. You'll never see, you'll never uh, be able to change your world if you cannot see beyond yourself. Jesus saw beyond himself. Remember, he, he, he was trying to get away with his disciples because he wanted some rest with them. He, he wanted to have some alone time with them. And then all of a sudden he arrives and there's this huge crowd. 
But Jesus was others-centered. So when he saw this huge crowd, he saw their need and he, and he took action. Taking action often requires a sacrifice. You know, I think of the young boy who sacrificed his food. I mean, actually, I, I'm amazed at, at this boy would sacrifice it. Now, now, maybe originally he started with 10 loaves and four fish, and he saw Andrew coming, and he started woofing down the food or something. I don't, I don't know. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I had, um, I had a snack-sized bag of uh, potato chips from Panera Bread. And I asked Linda, I, you know, because Linda always gets, like, the little, the little bread thing. So I asked her, do you want, do you want a, a potato chip? And, uh, and as soon as I asked her, immediately in my head, I'm saying, say no, say no, say no, say no. And she said, yes, you know, and then I, I, all I could do to muster up to, to give her one potato chip. And it was just one potato chip. And this boy was giving up all his food. But the boy was others-centered. He saw the needs of others, and he took action, and he offered what he had to help. You know, the disciples took action by telling Jesus to send the people away. And, and Mark writes this. He says, this is verse 35 and 36. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already late. It's already getting late. Send the crowd away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. Now, we can possibly look at the disciples as not being compassionate, like Jesus, send the crowd away. Get, get them out of here so we don't have to worry about feeding them. But maybe, maybe they, they saw no other way. Maybe they saw no other solution other than sending the people out to find some food for themselves. Because while we call this the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, many believe that there could have been between 10 to even 15,000 people that were gathered there. Because Matthew lets us know that there were women and children there besides the 5,000 men. Some even think that this might have been the largest crowd that Jesus ever ministered to at one time. So, so maybe the disciples just saw no other solution. Uh, to, this, to this problem. When Jesus asked Philip, we find this in, in John's account, uh, where they could buy food to feed the people. Philip, evidently kind of being a numbers guy, said, well, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for them just to get, just to get a bite. When Jesus asked the disciples to find out, well, what food do we have here? And they come back with the five loaves and two fish. Andrew says, but how far will these go among so many? I mean, what, what good is... What good is this going to do with this huge crowd that we have? See, the disciples saw the size, the need, and the littleness of their resources. And so maybe they could see no other solution than to send the crowd away to find food for themselves. You know, so often I think that we do want to do something. We want to take action. But sometimes the need seems so great and our resources seem so little. Sometimes the need seems so great and beyond us, or, or the need seems so great and, and we just feel so inadequate and unqualified, and so we fail to take action. You know, we often become limited by our own minds. Maybe that stems from uh, past failures that we have experienced. Maybe that stems from what others have said to us or about us that has made us feel small or, or insignificant or ungifted or unable to help. And when we hear those negative words over and over, and we play them over and over again in our heads, we begin to believe them, we begin to think that way, and so that we fail to take action. We become limited in our thinking. And so we need to change the way we are thinking. We need to change the way we think. Uh, let me try to illustrate it with, with, this, with this puzzle. If, if you could just put those, uh, that puzzle up on, on the board there. Thanks. All right. So here's the puzzle. Some of you probably have seen this before or done this. Now, now this is like really challenging for me, and, and I, I can't really do it. But this is the challenge that I have for you. I want you to find a way to connect all nine dots. So hopefully those at home can see this, but we have nine dots up there with three columns with three in each of them, all equally spaced. And so what I want you to do, I want you to find a way to connect all nine dots using just four straight lines without lifting your pen or pencil from the paper. Now you realize that with this COVID thing, we can't give you a handout here. So you kind of have to like do it with your hands and I can laugh at you while I see people reading their hands. But in your mind, you know, just try to picture, you have to make four straight lines connecting all dots and you cannot lift your hand off the surface of the thing. Again, you know, for me, and I think for others probably too, but this is really hard 
uh, for me to figure out and, and to be, be able to do because I have a hard time thinking outside the box. John Maxwell writes, the only way to solve the problem is to change the way you think and get outside of the self-imposed way of thinking. Now, I know I didn't give you enough time, and some of you probably are super smart, so you have figured out, so I put it up. But why don't we put up the next slide of the solution? See, what you, you must do, you must, you know, you start up in that far right-hand top, and the line comes down, and you must extend the line past the dots. And as you extend the line past the dots, you're able to connect all at one time. You have to draw outside the line that you may have arbitrarily uh, imposed surrounding those dots. You have to change the way you think. And that's true concerning our thoughts that keep us so often from taking action. Rosamond and Benjamin Zander, and you could put that down now if you like. Rosamond and Benjamin Zander wrote this. They said, the frames our minds create define and confine what we perceive to be possible. Every problem, every dilemma, every dead end we find ourselves facing in life only appears unsolvable inside a particular frame or point of view. Enlarge the box or create another frame around the data and the problem vanish, and the problems vanish while new opportunities appear. If we're going to change our world, we need to shift our thinking from assuming that we can't or that we shouldn't even try to change our world to someone who can and should change their world. And so maybe if you're feeling inadequate about past failures, you need to change the way you think about failure. You need to, re you need to redefine failure as lessons because every time we fail, it's actually an education. Thomas Edison failed 10,000 times as he was trying to create the light bulb. And when he was asked about how he dealt with all those failings, his answer was, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Or, or maybe you're feeling inadequate because of what others have said to you or about you. And you need to re rethink. You need to reach and change your thinking. You need to remember that the truest thing about you is what God says about you. And God says that you're loved and that you're chosen and that, that you're wonderfully and awesomely made, that you're you're his masterpiece and that he has gifted you to do the good things that he prepared for you long ago. You know, the, the disciples told Jesus, you know, we need to send the people away so they can get something to eat, possibly because they saw no other solution. And I, I love what Jesus says to them here. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. You feed them. I, I mean, again, here the disciples are thinking, Boy, I think the best possible solution is, is to have the people go and find their own food. And, and Jesus says, no, you, you feed them. And the disciples' reaction is like, what, are you kidding with what? It would take more than half a year's wages, and Philip already said they would only get a bite if we do that. How are we going to do this? But I love this part of the story when Jesus says, you give them something to eat. You feed them. Because it's like Jesus is saying to them, you can do more than you think you can. You can do more than you think you can. And he says the same thing to you and to me. You can do more than you think you can. Maybe you're in a situation where you see a need and you just think it's pretty overwhelming and you just don't know where to start. I don't know how to take action. Well, here Jesus tells the disciples, hey, go and find out what food we have. And Andrew comes back with the boys, five loaves and two fish. Jesus had them go out and find out what they had. And so if we're going to take action, just start with what you have. Start with what you have. God begins where we are, and he uses what we have. You know, it's so easy for us to focus on what we don't have. But we need to focus on what we do have. Start with, you, start with what you have and give it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. The disciples gave what they had to Jesus. The boy gave what he had to Jesus, and it was enough. And whatever you have to offer, it's enough. You know, again, so often we compare ourselves uh, to other people. We think, wow, look at all the stuff that they have and, and all the stuff that they're able to do, and, 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 and I, I can't do all that. But God has gifted each and every one of us, and he wants us to use our gifts for him to help others 
to change our world, to, to make it a better place, to make it more of a place that he wants it to be. In, in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells the parable, the story of the talents or the story of the bags of gold. And in this story, uh, the master is leaving on, on a long journey. And so he calls three of his servants uh, to him. And to one servant, he gives five bags of gold. To another servant, he gives two bags of gold. And to a third servant, he gives one bag of gold. And the servant with the five bags of gold puts it right to work, and he gains five more. And the servant with the two bags of gold puts it right to work, and he gains two more. And, and the servant with the one bag of gold just digs a hole, and he buries it. And then the master returns. And in verse 9 of, of Matthew chapter 25, we read, after a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you would trust me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. You know, we live in a day and age where only the best gets the big prize. But notice here that the master gives the same praise and same reward to both the servant who had the ten bags of gold and the one who had the four bags of gold. Jesus praises them both for using what they had been given. Listen, we're all different. There, there are some people that we see and we say, man, that he, she, they, they got five bags of gold. They, they have it all. They, they can do it all, it seems like. And then we look at ourselves and say, boy, I only have two bags of gold, and may, maybe even just one. But notice here, it's not about the amount of bags that you have. It's about what you do with the bag or bags that you have. Look at what is said to the servant who had the one bag. Verse 24, it says, the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See is here what belongs to you. The third servant is reprimanded, scolded, not because he only had one bag, but because he did not use the one bag that he had. Now, maybe the servant was somewhat lazy. He says he was afraid. Maybe he was afraid that he might fail. And that fear caused him not even to try to succeed and do something. Maybe he felt sorry for himself or even mad that he only had one bag and other people had more bags. Maybe the one bag servant thought, you know, what's, how important can one bag possibly be? What difference can I make? But it's not about the amount of bags that you have. It's about what you are doing with the bags or bag that you have been given. We need us one bag people. Much would not get done if it wasn't for us one bag people in this world. We each have at least one bag of gold. Don't waste your time saying, why can't I have more or I'm not as good as her because she has five bags and I only have one or two. Start with what you have. Give what you have to Jesus. See, God starts with what we have. Jesus, he's not discouraged by the little that we have to offer. He can do more than we can ever imagine. Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish. And not only did he feed a crowd of possibly 10,000 people, he had 12 basketfuls left over. They had more food left over than what they started with. Jesus' resources are limitless. And he simply asks us to give to him all that we have. And let him use it as he sees fit. And, we, and when we do that, he uses us to change our world. If you're going to change your world, you must see the need. If you're going to change your world, you must take action. And if you're going to change your world, you must trust Jesus. You know, could, could you imagine being one of the disciples handing out the food? You know, you, you know what you started with, that you only had five loaves of bread and two fish, and somehow at this point, Jesus has been able to give each of, his, each of us, his disciples, you know, something to hand out. Now, I'm always, 
I'm always afraid of running out of food. So like when I order pizza for activities, I always order more than, than I'm going to need because I don't want to run out of food. I'm scared of running out of food. And I've tried to get in better with that and, and make it a little bit closer, but then I'm always panicking. Am I going to have enough? And so if I was handing out the bread and the fish, you know, I would have been given a few instructions. Say, hey, now listen, you know there's a large crowd here. You know, we're not sure how much we have here, so, so don't take too much. And if someone's taking too much, I'd be like, what's your problem? You know, why are you so selfish? You know, look, there's 10,000 more people that need to eat something. Stop, don't take so much. I mean, it, it could have been a little scary thing for the disciples wondering how in the world is this going to work. I mean, they were the ones in the crowd, you know, handing out the food. So if they ran out of food and it got ugly, you know, they were the ones right in the midst. But they trusted Jesus, and they did what he asked. They went and found out how much food they had. They sat the people in groups of 50 and 100 as Jesus asked them to. And as Jesus asked them to, they began the process of passing out the food that they had received from Jesus. They obeyed and trusted Jesus. And Jesus worked his miracle through them. You know, the, the very first um, summer trip I took with the youth from this church it was a camping trip to New York. It was on the New York, uh, New Jersey border. It was a unique trip, uh, a unique first trip because uh, only guys went. It was only high school guys that, that ended up going. And, and uh, the main attraction of the trip, besides camping and being together and, of course, listening to me talk, you know, uh, was going to Action Park in New, in New Jersey. And the park had, I think, two sections at that time, uh, maybe three. But the main part was this, this water park. And I think it was actually one of the early uh, first modern um, water parks in, in America, I think, even possibly. Uh, it closed back in 1996, uh, just seven years after we were there. Uh, evidently, they, they had a number of lawsuits. Uh, as I looked it up on Wikipedia, Wikipedia, you know, they, they had nicknames of Traction Park or Accident Park or Class Action Park, you know. It made me understand why I've never seen any of those featured rides at other water parks, you know, today. It made sense to me now. But one of the attractions was this cliff jump that they had. You, you walked out to this area, and it was like, like you're out on a, kind of like a mountain in, in, in cliffs. And they had these two areas where you could jump uh, from into the water below. Now, now, me being afraid of heights, I really wasn't thrilled with this one. And, uh, and so I was trying to discourage the guys. I say, you know what, why don't we try this one? Or, you know, that last one when I was great, why don't we do that one again? But these guys were kind of set on, no, we're going to jump. And I, and I was young back then, you know, so I felt the pressure. Boy, I can't back down to these guys, you know, so, so I'm going to have to do this. And so they had uh, an 18-foot uh, jump. You could jump from 18 feet or 24 feet. So some of the guys want to go 24 feet. I'm saying, well, I think 18 is good, you know. And uh, why don't we start with the 18 one? And so, uh, so I remember, you know, when it was my turn, I'm getting to the edge, you know. And for those of you who are afraid of heights, you know, you, you know I always have this feeling. I'm just, I'm just flipping over. I'm just going to fall, you know. And, uh, and, and I remember thinking, what in the world am I doing? And thinking, boy, I, I could use a bathroom right now, you know. And, um, <laughs> but, but I get to the edge, and finally I take that leap, and I jump. Amazed I didn't have a heart attack on the way down. But I took that leap and I jumped. You know, stepping out and taking action and offering what you have to Jesus to be used by Jesus can sometimes be scary. You know, it, it can be scary when you know that someone's hurting and, and you really sense that God wants you to go talk to that person, but you have no idea what to say. You're kind of scared to do that. Or you have that friend that you want to invite to youth group or a person you want to invite to church or, or you see a ministry that could use some help, but you're, I don't know if I could do that. You, and sometimes it's a little bit scary. Sometimes you just got to take that leap. And you got to jump. Trust in Jesus all the way. Trust in him to take whatever you have to offer, whether you think it's much or little. Trust in him that he can use it and that, you can, that he can help you to change your world. See, the disciples took that leap. They trusted Jesus. And the disciples saw that they could accomplish more than they ever dreamed of because of their connection with Jesus. So my question is, will you take that leap? Will you trust Jesus? And hey, you don't have to go up the 20 foot, 24 foot one. You know, you start out a smaller one. See, Jesus meets us right where we are, and he moves us along. And so will you let him? Because he wants to use you, and he wants to use you to accomplish what he wants done. And that's just an amazing thing. 
Because you do realize that Jesus didn't need the boy's lunch to feed those people. I mean, if Jesus could, if Jesus could speak the world into existence, he could have spoken enough food into existence to feed that crowd. If God was able to provide manna in the wilderness day after day for the Israelites, he certainly could have taken care of one afternoon for this crowd that was gathered. But Jesus chose to use what the boy had to offer. And Jesus chooses to use what you and I have to offer to accomplish all that he wants to be accomplished. And so will you see the need? Will you take action? And will you trust Jesus and let him use you to change your world. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you.